The Mauryan Empire at its height stretched over parts of modern Iran and almost the entire Indian subcontinent. The empire came into being when Chandragupta Maurya, aided and counseled by his mentor Kautilya, stepped into the vacuum created by Alexander's departure from the western borders of India. Ashoka the Great, the third king of the Mauryan Empire, is better known for his renunciation of war, development of the concept of Dhamma, and promotion of Buddhism, as well as effective reign of nearly a pan-Indian political entity. Chandragupta Maurya, known as Sandrakotos to the Greeks, was the founder of the Maurya dynasty and he is credited with the setting up of the first pan-Indian empire. Aided by his mentor and late minister Chanakya or Kautilya, he set up a vast centralized empire, details of whose functioning, society, military and economy are well preserved in Kautilya's Ardhashastra. India around the 4th century BC was divided into numerous kingdoms and republics. The foremost among them was the Magadha kingdom in the eastern India, whose ruler, beginning with the king Bimbisara, has embarked on a quest for empire building. Alexander the Great invaded India in 326 BC, and in consequence, much of the northwestern India was thrown into turmoil and political chaos. The Magadhan ruler at this time was Dhananda of the Nanda dynasty. He possessed a vast pressure and an army numbering 20,000 cavalry, 200,000 infantry, 2,000 chariots and 3,000 elephants. Known to the Greeks as Xanramas, their knowledge of the Magadhan might had also added to the despair of the already war-weary Macedonian troops on India's northwest, forcing them, among other reasons, not to press further into India. Using the post-Macedonian area of Northwest India as an ideal base, due to its chaotic condition and lack of military opposition, Chandragupta deployed his men and challenged the waning Greco-Macedonian authority and scored victories over the local kingdoms or whatever was left of them. He then gained control over the central India and finally advanced towards the Magadha headland. Realizing that a conflict with Magadha would necessarily entail much more than a mighty army, Prime Minister of Chandragupta, Kotilya, went for the war by other means strategy. There were a lot of intrigues, counter-intrigues, plotting and counter-plotting which he employed in order to break the strength of Dhananda by waning away his key allies, loyalists and supporters. Ultimately, by employing both military and non-military means, Chandragupta managed to secure the thron thrones of Pataliputra. Dhananda probably escaped or was killed. Secure in the imperial seat, Chandragupta directed his attention towards expanding his dominion. The Mauryan armies reached as far as the western coast of India and southern India, particularly the present-day state of Karnataka. Chandragupta overran the entire region that is today's North India with an army of 600,000. In the northwest, they held sway over certain areas which were not included even in the British Empire. The extreme south and the extreme northeast India was, were the only areas that was not part of the empire. Chandragupta fought a war with Seleucus I Nikitor, Alexander's heir in the east. The war ended in 301 BC by signing of a treaty. Chandragupta obtained the areas of Kandahar area in the present day Afghanistan southern Baluchistan in the present-day Pakistan and the areas between Afghanistan and Indian subcontinent. 500 elephants were given to the Greeks. It was also decided to appoint a Greek ambassador as a result. Megasthenes came to the Mauryan court at Pataliputra. He wrote about the Mauryan administration through his work Indica, which is now lost, quotations of which survive in the work of several subsequent Greek writers. Both historical evidence and popular belief state that Chandragupta in his later years accepted Jainism. Chandragupta probably abdicated, became an ascetic and later died by following the ritual of fasting till death. Chandragupta thus ruled for 24 years and was succeeded by his son Bindusara, the father of Ashoka the Great. Chandragupta's social origins are still debated. 
ancient literary works all give different versions. He is mentioned variously as belonging to the Kshatri Maurya clan or being from a tribe of peacock tamers or a son of a woman named Nura and even closely or distantly related to the Nandas. Irrespective of what Chandragupta's origins were, what can be stated with certainty is his relationship with the statesman philosopher Vishnugupta Chanakya or Kautilya. He was his best ally, mentor and a guide and the one who shaped not only his career but the course of the Mauryan Empire. Kautilya on his part has decided to take the leading role in rebuilding and reshaping the Indian polity. Being a student and later a teacher at the Takshasila, Kautilya thus became witness to the political turmoil created in the Northwest India because of the Macedonian invasion. This caused him to think in terms of establishing a centralized pan-Indian empire that could, invade, that could keep invaders at bay and restore order. He considered Magadha apt to be the empire in question. His proposal for the same was met by scorn and insults from Dhananda. Magadha was the only territorial entity that could provide order among chaos. It had a virtually unrivaled military. It enjoyed a stability that other kingdoms could not. He thus decided to replace Dhananda with a better and more capable candidate. The man chosen was Chandragupta Maurya. How and when his first meeting with Chandragupta took place are facts not clearly known. Historians maintain the young man Chandragupta, who was already seeking to make his fortune, met and allied with Kautilya, whom he had realized as an invaluable ally. Ashoka the Great was the third king of the Mauryan Empire. At its height, under Ashoka, the Mauryan Empire stretched from modern-day Iran through almost the entirety of the Indian subcontinent. Ashoka means without sorrow, which was most likely his given name. He is said to have been particularly ruthless early in his reign until he launched a campaign against the kingdom of Kalinga, which resulted in such carnage, destruction and death that Ashoka renounced war and in time converted to Buddhism. Devoting himself to peace as exemplified in his concept of Dharma, most of what is known of him outside of his edicts came from the Buddhist texts. Although Ashoka's name appears in the Puranas, no information on his life is given there. The details of his youth, rise to power and renunciation of violence following the Kalinga campaign came from the Buddhist sources, which are considered in many respects more legendary than historical. His birth date is unknown. The story of the hundred sons of Bindusara is dismissed by most scholars who believe Ashoka was second of the fourth. His older brother Sushima was the heir apparent and crown prince. Ashoka was highly educated at court, trained in martial arts and was no doubt instructed in the precepts of Ardhashastra. When Ashoka was around the age of 18, he was sent to Takshashila to put down a revolt. Bindusara next sent his son to govern the commercial center of Ujjain, which he also succeeded in. No historical accounts survive of Ashoka's campaigns at Takshasila or Ujjain. Ashoka was still at Ujjain when Takshasila rebelled again and Bindusara this time sent Sushima. Sushima was still engaged in the campaign when Bindusara fell ill and ordered his elder son's recall. The king's minister, however, favored Ashoka's a successor and was crown king upon Bindusara's death. Afterwards, he had Sushima executed by throwing him into a charcoal pit where he burned to death. Once Ashoka has assumed power, by all accounts, he established himself as a cruel and ruthless despot who pursued pleasures at the subject's expense. This is most likely true, but at the same time may not be. That his policy of cruelty and ruthlessness was a historical fact is borne out by his edicts which addresses the Kalinga war and laments the dead and lost. The kingdom of Kalinga was south of Pataliputra on the coast and enjoyed considerable wealth through trade. The Mauryan empire surrounded Kalinga and the two polities evidently prospered commercially from interaction. What prompted the Kalinga campaign is unknown, but in 260 BC, Ashoka invaded the kingdom, slaughtering around 100,000 inhabitants, deporting 150,000 more, 
and leaving thousands of others to die of disease and famine. Afterwards, it is said, Ashoka walked across the battlefield, looked upon the death and destruction, and experienced a profound change of heart. Ashoka then renounced war and embraced Buddhism, but this was not the sudden conversion it is usually portrayed as, but rather a gradual acceptance of Buddha's teachings. According to the accepted account, once Ashoka embraced Buddhism, he embarked on a path of peace and ruled with justice and mercy. Modern day scholars have questioned how accurate this depiction is. However, noting that Ashoka did not return the kingdom to the survivors of the Kalinga campaign, or nor is there any evidence he called back who has been deported. He made no efforts at disbanding the military. The Ardhashastra makes clear that a strong state can only be maintained by a strong king. In following the principle, Ashoka would not have been able to implement Buddhism fully as a new government policy. Because, first of all, he needed to continue to present a public image of strength. And secondly, most of the subjects were not Buddhist and would have, been, would have presented this policy. Ashoka have been unable to return Kalinga to the people because it would have made him appear weak and encouraged other powers towards acts of aggression. About 50 years after Ashoka's death, the then Mauryan king was killed by the general-in-chief Pushyamitra who founded the Shunga dynasty. Scholars give various reasons for the empire's downfall, the major ones being its size and it was its weak, weak rulers after Ashoka. By the time Pushyamitra seized the throne, the mighty Mauryan Empire was a fraction of its size, reduced to only the three city-states of Pataliputra, Ayodhya and Vidisha, and some parts of Punjab. After he embraced Buddhism, Ashoka embarked on pilgrimages to the site sacred to Buddha and began to disseminate his thoughts on Dhamma. He ordered edicts engraved in stone throughout his empire and sent Buddhist missionaries to other regions and nations including modern-day Sri Lanka, China, Thailand and Greece. In doing so, he established Buddhism as a major world religion peacefully. Ashoka ordered the construction of 84,000 stupas throughout his country, each to have some part of Buddha's remain inside. The number is definitely an exaggeration but there is no doubt that Ashoka did order construction of a number of them, such as the famous work at Sanchi. Ashoka died after reigning for nearly 40 years. Although he was the greatest of the kings of one of the largest and most powerful empires in antiquity, his name was lost to history. His stupas became overgrown and his edicts carved on majestic pillars, toppled and buried by the sands. When European scholars began exploring Indian history in the 19th century, the British scholar James Princep came across an inscription on the Sanchi stupa in an unknown script, which eventually he came to understand as referencing a king by the name of Devampiya Piyadasi, who as far as Princep knew, was referenced nowhere else. In time and through the efforts of Princep in deciphering Brahmi script, it was understood that Ashoka, named as a Mauryan king in the Puranas, was the same as this Devampiya Piyadasi. Since then, Ashoka has come to be recognized as one of the most fascinating ancient monarchs for his decision to renounce war, his insistence on religious tolerance, and his peaceful efforts in establishing Buddhism as a major world religion. Mauryas developed an elaborate system of imperial administration most of the power was concentrated in the king's hands and he was assisted in his duties by a council of ministers. The empire was divided into provinces and had princes as viceroys. The provinces were divided into smaller units and arrangements were put in place for both urban and rural administration. Archaeological evidence of the existence of a number of towns and cities has been found. Of this, the most prominent was the capital of Pataliputra. Its administration was carried out by six committees. The central government also maintained about two dozen departments looking after various social and economic activities. The state possessed a huge army. Troops were recruited, trained and equipped by the state. 
Mercenaries also existed in large number, as did the corporate guild of soldiers, and they were recruited whenever required. The army was composed of four arms, infantry, cavalry, chariots, and elephants. There was a 30-member war office made up of six boards. Chandragupta possessed 600,000 infantry, 30,000 cavalry, and 9,000 elephants. The chariots were estimated at 8,000. The king and princess were well trained in the arts of war and leadership. The navy created by Chandragupta mostly performed coast guard functions and guarded the empire's vast trade being carried out on the waterways. The state virtually controlled all economic activities and hence was able to command large revenues and an abundance of financial resources. Mauryas thus left behind a legacy that has survived in the pages of the Ardhashastra. It was these achievements that made them one of ancient India's foremost rulers and the near mythical figures of folklore. Hello guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I realize most of you have not lasted till the end of this video. In all probability, you skipped after the first minute itself. But those who did, leave your name in the comment section. Anyone new around here, please click that subscribe button and don't forget to like this video. Thanks.